It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal yeah. Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Premier. Premier, the uh, direction that you chose to take with this budget is one that uh, obviously the PC party fundamentally disagrees with. It's obvious in how you ignore Ontario's massive debt, high unemployment, and credit rating warnings that balancing the budget is not a priority for you. The fact that you have no detailed plan to reduce costs is more proof that you're just not serious. But the day of reckoning is going to come when Ontario's lenders tell you that Ontario's credit card has maxed out. Premier, how high are Ontario's borrowing costs going to get before you tell Ontario's bankers how you're going to balance the budget? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm, uh, I'm sure that the uh, the Leader of the Opposition just neglected to mention that the uh, Dominion Bond Rating Service today has confirmed our rating and our outlook. Um, and according to right. And according to DBRS, the trend on all uh, ratings remains stable, supported by five consecutive years of lower than expected deficits, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, I would uh, I would suggest to the uh, member opposite that yes. We do have a fundamental disagreement with them about what the future should hold for the people of the province of Ontario. And what we believe the future should hold is a, a thriving economy bolstered by and supported yes, by sir. a government that understands that investments are important, community by community, whether it's in the education of the children and the grandchildren of those communities or whether it's in their Thank transportation you. infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Premier, you often talk about building Ontario up, but the only thing that you're building up is a tremendous debt load for future generations. If you won't tell us where you're going to cut, then will you at least tell Ontarians where you're going to raise their taxes? Because it's being said that you can't have an activist agenda without raising taxes. So where will those next tax increases be, Mr. Speaker? Premier, are you planning on raising land transfer taxes for home buyers? Are you planning on raising eco fees or the cost of vehicle registration? Will you raise the gas tax? Which Ontarians are you going to hit the hardest with your inevitable tax increases? Very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, if the, if the leader of the opposition would read the budget, he would see exactly he would see exactly where uh, those decision points are, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's very clear that we have laid out the investments that we are proposing, but we've also uh, we've also addressed the revenue side of the legislature of the ledger, Mr. Speaker. We've made it clear that we are going to ask the top. 2% of earners in the province to pay a little bit more, Mr. Speaker. We've said that we, uh, we are going to make sure that the assets of, uh, that are owned by the people of Ontario, that they're working as hard as they can and that they are, their value is optimized for the people of the province. Mr. Speaker. We've made those decisions. They're all laid out in the budget. And I know that, uh, I know that the Leader of, of the Opposition will take a second look so he can see those, uh, those measures Answer. in place, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Premier, you've not been honest with the people of Ontario. You have no detailed plan to balance the books uh, within the next uh, three years. You know, despite what Dominion bond rating has said, Moody's and others, Standard and Poor has you on a watch list. Moody has you on a negative outlook. Your borrowing costs are going to go up. You're going to have to touch frontline services. And in fact, in an unguarded moment yesterday, you did say, uh, "Quote." We will cut where we must. So, you know, even Smokey Thomas, head of OPSU, called you out yesterday when he said, with what you're promising to spend and how you're promising to control costs, the public service could only shrink. All we're asking, Premier, is to be honest. You've already fired nurses in Windsor. You've fired nurses and teachers in, in North Bay. You've cut physiotherapy services, that they're a disgrace now for our, our seniors, particularly seniors in retirement. Question. What further frontline services are you going to cut? Just be honest with the people of Ontario. Thank you very much. Well, I think the uh, member opposite knows that there are 20,000 more nurses in Ontario today than there were in 2003, Mr. Speaker. And I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to quote from the uh, Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Alan Odette, who's their uh, CEO, says, and I quote, I think the budget strikes a good degree of balance. We recognize the significance of having the pension funds available for that cohort of Ontarians that are going to need it, unquote. So what our budget does is it invests in the transit that we know is needed in communities in our urban and suburban centres and also in our rural and northern communities, Mr. Speaker, because roads and bridges and transit are all part of that infrastructure that
that's necessary, as well as hospitals and schools that we know are necessary for future prosperity. We're going to invest in the education of our people, Mr. Speaker, of the children and the grandchildren who are going Answer. to be who are going to be the job creators of the future, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to set up an Ontario Retirement Pension Plan because we know that people are not able to save enough and they need that security in their retirement, Mr. Speaker. I'm just going to ask everyone to settle down. A new question, the member from Elgin Middlesex. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister, your ministry recently outlined plans to levy a number of additional fees on hunters and anglers. For instance, your plan to, and this is for the first time ever, require seniors to pay for fishing licenses, minister something they've long been exempted from. This comes after the minister reported that the special purposes account, which is funded by license fees and is required to be used for purposes of managing Ontario's fish and wildlife resources, increased by 31 per cent from 2010 to 2011. Yet just last year, the MNR announced layoffs and reductions that prompted the Environmental Commission to destate, and I quote, it appears that the Ministry of Natural Resources is walking away from many parts of its job to safeguard wildlife and natural resources. Minister, how can you justify uh, levying additional fees when your revenues are up? Question. And according to the province's environmental watchdog, you're doing less work. Thank you, Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much, and I want to uh, thank the member for the question. What I would begin by saying is what's occurring within the ministry today is no different than what's been going on for a very long time. Uh, the member will know that the special purpose account has been for, around for a very long time. The percentage of money that flows into that account is approximately 66 percent from users and approximately 33 percent from the CRF. On a go-forward basis, there's an acknowledgement that there are challenges with the SPA. They're concerned about the revenue side in terms of uh, the, the, the revenue that will flow in there. This is being witnessed right across the country. It makes complete sense to everybody that there should be a, a, a review of the account. That's what's occurred. No final decisions have been made. Uh, it has been posted on the registry. The results are internal, and at some point in the go forward, in, in the near future, we'll be making a decision. Answer. Nothing has been decided at this point. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, back to the minister. Minister, I'd like to ask you more about recent figures about the account. But your ministry has not released the annual report for the special purpose count for the last two years. Uh -huh. I have the 2010-2011 report sitting on my desk. It's 10 pages long with little to zero detail. I was told by your office that I have to wait until this fall to get the 2011-2012 report and then another year for the 2012-2013 report. Minister, you're asking hunters and anglers of this province to pony up more money, but you can't even produce a 10-page report about where the money goes until two years after it's relevant. Minister, with the Environmental Commissioner observing a decrease in your resource management activities and your lack of transparency when it comes to reporting the state of the special purpose account, how can you expect hunters and anglers in this province just to give you more money? Well, Speaker, to repeat, we haven't done that yet. The posting is on the EBR. No final decisions have yet been made. I would give the member one example of what has been done very recently in the ministry when it comes to sustainability of the fish and wildlife sector in the province of Ontario. We just committed, I think the number was about $5 million for the moose aerial inventory in a several wildlife management units in northwestern Ontario. That was key and instrumental in maintaining sustainability of the moose inventory in the province of Ontario. What that investment found was that, in fact, moose numbers had significantly declined. There is serious concern about what's going on with moose inventory in Ontario. It was that investment of money, some of which comes from the SPA that the member is speaking to today, that is going to infuse our future decision and policy making on a go-forward basis. It's necessary. Answer. If we're serious about maintaining fish and wildlife in the province of Ontario, we need to have the means to do that. This is one of the means. No final Thank decisions you. have been made just yet. Thank you. Minister, if you're serious about open and transparent, we'd have the details of the SBA fund in our hands today. Two years. Minister, in addition to your ministry delivering its SBA report two years after the fact, there is no detail on how the money is spent. I'm concerned that you, like the rest of your government, feel it's okay to continue to ask Ontarians to pay more without being fully accountable. Hunters and anglers are not able to see where their money goes and yet you want to levy them with additional fees. Minister, your government has overspent for years, and now Ontario faces a $12.5 billion deficit and a possible credit downgrade. Is levying more fees on hunters, fishers, and our seniors your strategy to balance the budget? Thank you. Thank you, 
Speaker, thank you very much. Well, once again, the same question three times. As I mentioned to the member already, no final decisions have been made That's on right. what will be done with the SPA. Everything is on the table. The process, the consultation was posted on the EBR, Order. I think, sometime in April. It was there for 45 days. All of the responses are now in-house, and in the near future, we will be making decisions on what we will do. I will say to the member again, if we are serious about maintaining in a sustainable fashion fish and wildlife populations here, here. in the province of Ontario, we need to have the means to do that. Absolutely. I am not giving the member uh, my position on this. I'm simply saying that as a government, we all know that we need to have the means in which to do this. The SPA is one of the means. 66% has traditionally come from the SPA, 33% has traditionally come from the CRF. We will make decisions in the near future. Answer. We'll communicate those decisions to my critic. And again today, Speaker, yeah, yeah. I thank him for the questions, restating no final decisions have been made as of yet. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. New Democrats have been calling this a uh, Trojan horse budget because it looks like one thing, but inside are all kinds of surprises that the Liberals would rather keep hidden. The uh, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will withdraw. Please ask your question. It looks like one thing, Speaker, but inside are all sorts of surprises that the Liberals would want to keep hidden. In fact, the Globe and Mail says, in black and white, that there is a major gap between, and I quote, the government's rhetoric surrounding the budget and the actual budget, unquote. They say, quote, the actual budget is an austerity budget, unquote. Now, the Liberals' plan uh, says that there is going to be $3.15 billion that's coming from the sale of public assets, Speaker, but the Premier won't even say those words. Why won't the Premier come Question. clean with her plan to sell Sell off public assets, assets like the LCBO, LCBO, the OPG, and Hydro One. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, that plan that the uh, the leader of the of uh, the third party is talking about uh, doesn't exist. The fact is that we have asked we have asked Ed Clark, who's the retiring CEO of uh, the Toronto Dominion Bank, to um, to look at to look at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario. And we've asked him to make sure that those assets are producing the highest uh, return for the people of Ontario, because we believe that assets that were purchased and created and uh, have uh, worked for a number of years, um, that though the money that we can realize from those should be reinvested, Mr. Speaker, that those dollars should be reinvested in services and in uh, and in uh, assets for the future. So yes, we will sell real estate, Mr. Speaker. We will sell the LCBO headquarters. We've talked about that, and we will do that. But in terms of the uh, the other assets. That's an ongoing process. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I don't know how the Liberals plan to five, find $3.15 billion if their budget says they're going to do it by selling off assets and the Premier says they're not. Who knows really what the Liberals are up to in the province of Ontario, Speaker? Another thing that is hidden in the Liberal budget is massive cuts. One editorial in the National Post said that the Liberal Party is, quote, is not being straight with the citizens when it maps out its plans for the next few years, unquote. Page six of the budget speech says the Liberals will, quote, continue to cut. Will the Premier come clean with her plan on cuts and tell Ontarians exactly what's on the Liberal chopping block, Speaker? So, Mr. Speaker, let me just let me just frame this uh, this answer by saying to the leader of the third party that we recognize that there are challenges that we are confronting as a province. We recognize that there is a fiscal challenge ahead of us, and our budget addresses that. Yeah. And it addresses the need for investments right now, Mr. Right Speaker, now. to make sure that the economy can thrive. Those two things can exist and do exist side by side in our budget. I understand that the leader of the third party wants a simplistic analysis of the situation.
Immigration in Ontario because simplistic is easier for her to talk about. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that it is complex. There are competing priorities, and we have to address them both. That's what our budget does, Mr. Speaker, and the investments that we are committed Thank to you. are a very important part of that future economic growth. Final supplementary. Speaker, what New Democrats are looking for is the truth. What exactly that exists in that budget that's going to get this government uh, the cuts that they want? That's what we're asking. It's apparent that some of the cuts, Speaker, are going to be coming from public services. Ontarians just voted against firing 100,000 people, but Don Drummond says that the Liberal plan could mean 100,000 job cuts. Bloomberg News said the budget could mean the deepest cuts since Mike Harris. And yesterday, the finance minister stubbornly refused to answer questions about how many public service jobs the Liberals will in fact cut. So I guess it's one more thing that's hidden in the Trojan horse budget, Speaker. Will the Premier give the people of Ontario a straight answer Question. on how many nurses, firefighters, paramedics, early childhood educators and so many other public service workers are going to be fired in the province of Ontario under their plan? Mr. Speaker, <laughs> The remarkable thing about this line of questioning is that the leader of the third party based her albeit disjointed and disparate uh, platform on our fiscal plan. She used our fiscal plan as the foundation and then said she'd go $600 million more in terms of uh, our reductions, Mr. Speaker. So here's the thing. Our plan deals with the fiscal reality and lays out a path to balance by 2017-18, which she agreed with when she put together her, uh, her list of, uh, of platform items. But our plan also invests in the people of this province, invests in the schools and the hospitals that we know we need, Mr. Speaker, invests in and sets up a Made in Ontario retirement pension plan, increases the Ontario Child Benefit, increases social assistance benefits, and all of those things, Mr. Speaker, are things that I would have thought that the NDP would have Thank supported, you. Mr. Speaker. New question. Thank Here you, Speaker. Our next, uh, my next question is for the Premier. One of the things she forgets, like Liberals love to do, tell half the story, our plan included significant revenues, which they don't have, which is why they're making cuts and selling assets, Speaker. But scratch the surface in this Trojan horse plan, and you'll find a plan that leaves Bay Street better off but it leaves folks on Main Street out of work and out of pocket. Last month, 34,000 Ontarians lost a job. And this is what the Premier had to say about manufacture, the manufacturing sector in our province. And I quote, believe it or not, a lot has changed in Ontario since 1976. One thing that clearly has not changed, Speaker, is liberal arrogance. And it showed in spades yesterday. Is the Premier's plan to abandon manufacturing once and for all in the province of Ontario? Person, thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, what I'm not doing is burying my head in the sand and saying, I wish it were 1976. <laughs> we're not doing that. Even though I was way younger in 1976, Mr. Speaker, I do not think that it is responsible for the government to say, wish it was like that again. The fact is, Time has moved on. We are in a global economy. We're in a global competition, Mr. Speaker. And if we don't work with businesses to help them to upgrade so that they're able to compete, Mr. Speaker, if we don't play to our strengths in the auto sector and in aerospace and in agri-food and help those businesses to be competitive and invest in the new high-tech industries of the future, Mr. Speaker, if we don't do that, we can wish all we want that it were 1976, but it's not going to be and we will not have the bright future that we know we're taking. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. Would suggest is it's not responsible to sit by and watch 300,000 manufacturing jobs 
good manufacturing jobs walk out of this province with no plan whatsoever to stem it. Yesterday, the Premier insisted she's got a jobs plan for 2014, but it's the same jobs plan that put Ontario's unemployment rate above the national average in 2007, and it's the same plan that put Ontario's unemployment rate above the national average in 2008 and in 2009 and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13. The Premier's plan for jobs in 2014 is more no strings attached giveaways. It hasn't worked for years. Why does the Premier think it's going to work now all of a sudden? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, um, the uh, the work that we have done over the last number of years, and all of those years that the uh, the leader of the third party speaks of, are years that are since the economic downturn, Mr. Speaker. And the reality is that there are parts of this province, including the parts of the province with a high manufacturing uh, 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 sector, Mr. Speaker, that were hit very hard. I said on London Radio this morning that uh, there are parts of southwestern Ontario that were hit extremely hard because of their uh, reliance on manufacturing. So it is our it is our responsibility as a government to make sure that we make the investments and work with those communities so that that manufacturing sector can be competitive, that it can be uh, competitive with all of the global jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker. It is our responsibility to recognize yes, that sir. we have to have a strategy that acknowledges the realities of 2014. That's how we've managed to create and foster more than 460,000 net new jobs since the economic downturn, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, I'm hopeful about Ontario's future, but the Premier seems to think that good manufacturing jobs are a relic of the 1970s. But when 30, I, I, you know, and I'm full, hopeful about jobs as well, Speaker. I am hopeful about jobs. But when 34,000 Ontarians lost a job last month, our manufacturing sector hit nearly a 40-year low in terms of jobs, and when our unemployment rate is stubbornly stuck above the national average for years and years on end, can the Premier explain to Ontarians exactly how her plan that hasn't worked for years is somehow going to start working today? Well, Mr. Speaker, the recovery that has, uh, has been in place and the 460,000 net new jobs that have been created in Ontario since the economic downturn, I think are evidence that Although there is a fragility to that recovery, there is a recovery. We are coming back, Mr. Speaker, yep. but now is not the moment to talk Ontario down. Now is the moment to support the communities, to support the businesses in this province, to partner with them, to build the infrastructure that is necessary that they need in order to be able to move their goods around and that their employees need in order to be able to move around the province. Now is the moment that those, in, that those investments are important. That that's why our budget is crafted the way it is, with upfront investment, Mr. Yes, Speaker, in those things that are necessary to help the economy thrive, and a recognition of it, that at the same time we need to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. There's no either or there. We have Thank to do you. both. That's what our budget lays out, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister, as you're aware, the apple growers in my riding of Bruce Gray own sound and across Ontario have faced challenging times the last few years. However, they are looking forward to moving forward to rejuvenate their $60 million strong sector. Specifically, they want your help in facilitating a revitalization plan so they can plant new varieties of apples which produce higher yields. Implementing Ontario's own apple revitalization plan will ensure we're sustaining and enhancing a key aspect of our agricultural sector across the province, and specifically in the riding of Bruce Gray Owen Sound and Southern Georgian Bay Area, which represent a quarter of the province's apple production. Minister, my question is, to you is, what are you prepared to do to revitalize and rebuild Ontario's apple industry? Good question. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the member from Grey Bruce Owen Sound. He did uh, uh, provide me with a detailed letter yesterday on this very important issue. And uh, my ministry and now has commenced a review of this letter. And it'd be my commitment to, to get back uh, to this, the member of Grey Bruce Owen Sound as quickly as possible. We do know that the apple industry is crucial, uh, part of Ontario's agri-food business. And, uh, you know, just a week ago, I had the opportunity uh, to be fielding phone calls. A former 
colleague of Bill Murdoch has the Rocket Talk with Bill Murdoch, a photoed show. I spent an hour on that show, and there were very, uh, very detailed questions about the apple sector and other sectors of the agri-food co economy in that member's writing. And as I said, I make a commitment to that member to get back to him as quickly as possible on this very important issue. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister, as you're aware, we have a big opportunity to grow Ontario's apple industry so we're able to produce enough apples to supply the market, to increase our export prospects and to create jobs while strengthening this important agricultural partner. That your budget commits $40 million to food processing but commits none to food growers is disappointing and a bit perplexing. So, Minister, will you commit to utilizing a portion of the $40 million to facilitate the development of Ontario's own apple revitalization plan and be a champion for Ontario's apple industry. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for a supplementary. Uh, he did uh, make a very positive suggestion, and we'll certainly follow up on that. And you know, Mr. Speaker, later this year, the Premier, our Minister of Trade, uh, will be going on a trade mission to China. Uh, that will be a perfect opportunity. That will be a perfect opportunity to talk about the great food that is grown in Ontario, uh, to look at new markets uh, for such things as apples that are grown in Ontario, and that will be a great opportunity to do that. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank the, uh, the member for his question, and I want to commend all members of this House, get to your local farmers' markets and buy those Ontario apples, second to none. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Here are the facts of your so-called progressive budget. Program spending right, is flatlined for three years between 2014-15 and 2017-18. But given inflation and the growing population, that's a plan to essentially to cut spending by 3% each year. That's a 9% cut in real terms in program spending over three years. You didn't talk about that during the election. Uh, even the Globe and Mail calls this budget for what it is. It is an austerity budget. Will the Premier finally admit that a budget that cuts real program spending by 9 per cent is anything but progressive? It is an austerity budget, pure and simple. Thank you. Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was a real pleasure yesterday to reintroduce the budget that is progressive, that is positive, that does balance the books by 2017-18, and it looks after the best interests of the people of our province. People of the province who have, in fact, reviewed the budget over the last 60 days and have endorsed exactly the plan that we're putting forward, and it's a 10-year plan. We recognize the challenges that we face. That is why we've taken all the essential, necessary steps to recalibrate our spending where necessary, and we will cut where we can. We will invest where we must because that is what's going to enable us to succeed in the future for the benefit of our children and our grandchildren so that we do not pass the burden of debt on to future generations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, as I was saying, this is an austerity budget. And it gets worse because that 9% real cut to programs and services is going to cut far deeper in some areas than in others. This budget will hurt the people of this province, and you know it. Everyone in this House actually knows it. So we're talking about a potential 10 per cent cut or more in programs and services that everyday Order. folks depend upon. But this government won't come clean with the public and tell us where the cuts are going to fall. Will this government finally admit that its so-called progressive budget is truly a Trojan horse budget? And will it tell us where those 9 per cent cuts are going to happen, where it's going to hurt the people of this province, and how you are actually going to balance this budget? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. So, Mr. Speaker, we um, are making the necessary investments. We are doing what the people of Ontario and their priorities have brought to us because we took over 600,000 submissions in preparing this budget and this plan. We are continuing to do what's necessary to provide a jobs fund to, to, to enable more jobs and more investment in our province. We are the top jurisdiction in North America for foreign direct investment, surpassing California, Texas, New York, and every other province in Canada. But this is what the member opposite has voted against in terms of the progressive nature of this budget. She voted against a Maine Ontario pension plan. She voted against increasing Ontario child benefits. She voted against increasing social assistance benefits. She voted against increasing employment benefits. $810 million for adults in developmental disabilities. She voted against low-income health benefits 
and much more for our young people and personal support workers. Mr. Thank you. Any question? The member from the member for Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Premier, just after the Easter weekend in April, you visited the flood-affected areas in Belleville, only to let people there know that you had no immediate assistance to provide either to the municipality or to homeowners. One of the residents on River Road, Derek Swaffer, actually said uh, that you could visit his property as long as you did something about it. Three months later, here we are in the homes in Foxborough and Tweed that were hit by the flooding are still awaiting some kind of action. Premier, why does it seem that only residents in some disaster-affected parts of the province receive immediate help from this government? Good question. Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I think the member opposite knows full well that when there is an application in terms of disaster relief, that uh, that has to that has to go through a process. I think yep. he knows that perfectly well. He also knows that when there is a disaster, and it doesn't matter where it is in the province, there are emergency management personnel who are on the ground. Yep. They are at the disposal of those municipalities yep. in every situation, Mr. Speaker. And I spoke with mayors in the region that he's talking about. I've spoken with uh, mayors and councillors in other parts of the province where there has been yep. where there have been uh, problems, Mr. Speaker, whether it's uh, whether it was with tornadoes or whether it's flooding, Mr. Speaker. He knows full well that the emergency management response folks are available immediately. Those are provincial resources that are at the disposal of the municipalities. He knows that, Mr. Answer, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, let me remind the Premier that you could personally deliver gift cards and disaster relief when it was a riding that you wanted to take from the NDP. You were there the next morning knocking on their door with a gift card with the photo op going. The problem is it's not like this kind of a delay is a one-time occurrence. This isn't even the only municipality in Prince Edward Hastings that's waiting for disaster relief. Prince Edward County has been given the runaround in trying to fill out its disaster disaster relief paperwork for over a half million dollars worth of damage that it sustained during that same ice storm where you were gladly handing out the gift cards here in Toronto. In fact, your government has had to start up a special program just to deal with the issue for Prince Edward County. More red tape. Premier, you could find immediate relief for other municipalities affected by last winter's ice storm. Why is it that you can't do the right thing for the people of Prince Edward County and Prince Edward Hastings? They deserve it. Good question. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's a question that is well beneath the dignity of any member of this House because the reality is that it is the responsibility of government to deal with and to work with all of the people of the province, and that is what I do, Mr. Speaker, every single day. That is what our government does every single day, Mr. Speaker, and to suggest, to suggest that we would treat one part of the province differently than others is it is simply, simply not the case, Mr. Speaker. So, the Ontario Disaster Relief uh, Assistance Program (ODRAP) helps municipalities, individuals, but the, the member opposite knows perfectly well that there is a process. There is a process that requires that there be a distinction between what is the municipal infrastructure that needs support, what is the, what is the, the personal and private property that needs support, Mr. Speaker. It takes time Answer. to unravel that, whether it's in Godrich or whether it's in Thunder Bay or whether it's in Peterborough or whether it, whether it is in Prince Edward Hastings, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is that Thank that you. process is in place, and we will make sure that. Thank you. Your question, the member from Sudbury. Uh, the, the question is the Minister of Transportation. Minister, the people of the North have long called for the widening of northern highways as the lifelines to their communities. In particular, the four-laning or twinning of Highway 69 is a must for the health and safe, safety of those that travel north or south along that corridor as well as the economic development of the region. The budget table in this House tells us that in the last 10 years, only 50 kilometres of Highway 69 between Sudbury and Perry Sound have been widened. Right now, there's 18 kilometres under construction, with another 80 kilometres left to go. Meanwhile, the government has stated that the entire project will be completed by 2017-2018. Minister, Minister, will the government complete the four-laning of all of Highway 69 by 2017-18? Minister of Transportation. 
Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to begin uh, because I believe this is the uh, first question that the um, newly elected member from Sudbury has had the, ha the, the chance to ask him the question. I want to congratulate him on his election win. <clears throat> And I also want to say, Speaker, that uh, this government over the last 10 years has an extraordinary story to tell with respect to the commitments and the investments that we made in Northern Ontario. You got her, you got her. And, and that, Speaker, is in large part uh, due to the fact that the members that serve in this caucus and this government that have over the last 10 years have worked very, very hard to make sure uh, that we are moving forward in a positive way with the kinds of projects, including the project that the member from Sudbury has just talked about, Speaker. In fact, Speaker, since 2003, our government has invested more than $601 million, uh, and we've spent that on expansion to four lane and to initiate, initiate other safety improvements on Highway 69 between, for example, Port Severn and Sudbury. We know that we have additional work to do, Speaker. We will continue to Answer. work hard, and in yesterday's budget, we talked about the $29 billion that we intend to invest over the next 10 years to make sure that every corner of this province is properly served Thank with you. the transportation infrastructure that we need. Supplementary. Uh, Minister, I understand that the last 80 kilometer stretch of Highway 69 to be twinned first involves consultation with First Nations. What guarantees will this minister make that the twinning of Highway 69 will be completed by 2017-18? Thank you. Minister? Well, as I said, and I, I thank the, the member opposite for the supplementary question, as I said in my uh, initial answer, Speaker, we have worked very hard uh, over the last 10 years to make sure that all corners of this province, including Northern Ontario, including the community of Sudbury and areas near Sudbury, have had the investments that they need. As has been mentioned, 50 kilometres of this particular highway have already be com been completed, Speaker, and an additional 20 kilometres are currently under construction. I know that Ministry of Transporta Transportation staff are working very hard to get the needed approvals for the remaining 82 kilometres to complete the corridor. What I also know, Speaker, is that in yesterday's budget, as I mentioned a second ago, we committed to invest $29 billion over the next 10 years to make sure that communities right across this province, including in Sudbury, including across Northern Ontario, have the transportation Answer. infrastructure that they need. We will continue on this side of the House to work very hard to make sure that we fulfill fulfill these commitments. Thanks very Thank much, you. Mr. Speaker. Question. The member from Brampton, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, em Employment and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, small businesses are the cornerstone of our economy. In fact, 99 per cent of businesses in Ontario are small or medium-sized. Our government plan government's plan to create jobs and grow our economy will support small businesses by continuing to cut the red tape, invest in infrastructure, and make smart strategic investments that create conditions to allow businesses that need to thrive. The Minister recently reintroduced, reintroduced a bill that would legislate some of these objectives. Entrepreneurs and small business owners in Brampton Springdale are anxious to hear how this legislation will make running a business in Ontario easier. Could the minister please provide this House with an overview of the legislation and how it supports our government's plan to create jobs and grow our economy? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And congratulations to the member from Brampton Spring Bay. Her first question in the legislature, albeit with a little hesitation at first, but she's up on her feet, and it's great to see. Small business, Mr. Speaker, is critical to our economy. Uh, their innovation and entrepreneurial spirit creates jobs and drives our next generation economy. This government is committed to working with small businesses and the CFIB to do everything we can to make it easier to do business in Ontario. We've already removed 80,000 regulatory requirements on business. That's a 70 per cent cut in regulatory burden. The Better Business Climate Act, if passed, will commit the Ontario government to measuring and reporting annually on progress made in reducing regulatory burden. It also requires ministries to undertake and measure the impacts of one burden reduction project every year. By 2016-17, that will save Ontario businesses about $100 million dollars. We're proud of this piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker. I, I encourage the members opposite to support us in moving forward on behalf of small businesses in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for the update. 
It's great to hear how small businesses are being supported across Ontario, and I'm glad to see that this government recognizes the contribution that small businesses make to our economy. In my riding of Brampton Springdale, my constituents are looking to understand how our strategic investments and our partnerships with businesses are creating jobs and growing our economy across Ontario. Our government is committed to partnering with industry in a fiscally responsible way through initiatives like the Southwestern and Eastern Ontario Development Funds and the Rural Economic Development Fund. These investments help them compete and expand operations. Most importantly, these funds create jobs and grow our economy. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure, could the minister please elaborate on how this legislation will help Ontario build strong clusters to sustain our thriving economic sector? Question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're passionately committed to building a more competitive business environment in Ontario. By building regional uh, clusters and reducing regulatory burden, this legislation, if passed, will create jobs and grow our economy in all areas of the province. It will require government in consultation with business, academia, labour and non-profit organizations to develop plans for regional economic clusters. We know that strong regional hubs spur innovation and collaboration, and when sectors thrive, our province is better position to attract new global investments. Cisco and OpenText are just two examples of global companies that chose to invest in Ontario because of our thriving tech sector. This legislation would require government to publicly release cluster development plans with a mandate to review every five years. Combined with the measures proposed in our budget, these measures would build a stronger, more competitive Ontario economy and create jobs for our province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question? The member from Alderman Norfolk. Speaker, uh, the Minister of Natural Resources, I've uh, raised the question of Asian carp devastation with your predecessor, and he told me to go lobby my federal cousins. So I did talk to my federal counterpart, and I'm pleased to announce that they've tackled the problem. Alderman Norfolk, Cabinet Minister Diane Finley, and uh, Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, Larry Miller. We announced the opening of a state-of-the-art research facility in uh, Burlington that will allow the analysis of samples in Canada, rather than waiting on American facilities to do the work. The federal government also committed to more monitoring at detection sites and collaborative research with the United States. So, the ball is in your court, Minister. My question. question. When your ministry is when is your ministry going to go a step beyond the ban on live Asian carp and require any fish imported for food be gutted? Thank you. Here, here. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the member for the question. He absolutely raises an issue that is of serious concern to those of us on this side of the House and I think all parties, including both opposition parties. I want to thank him for the question. I would say the obvious response for me is the new Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry would be to congratulate the former minister on the introduction in the legislature of the Invasive Species Act, yeah, yeah. Which, in fact, which in fact was introduced into the legislature not that long ago. And as a result of the opposition parties making a decision that an election was necessary, that particular piece of legislation did not have an opportunity to come forward. Obviously, Speaker, it's our intention to reintroduce that legislation at the various, very earliest opportunity. Obviously, that speaks very clearly to how importantly we take this issue, as well as the issue around all invasive Answer. species in the province of Ontario. So we look forward to that opportunity to reintroduce this legislation at the earliest opportunity. Certainly, you know that uh, if Asian carp do become established in the Great Lakes, it will devastate our commercial fishery, our recreational fishery, our yep. boating industry. Yep. Minister, I traveled on my own dime to testify before the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on alternatives for the Chicago area waterways. When I read the, uh, the final transcripts of agencies, individuals who testified, no representation from the Ontario government. Why does your government still not take this seriously enough to not even provide uh, comments, let alone redirect necessary funding? We know MNR has finally allowed, uh, has finally been allowed by this government to table legislation, not that the CARP are going to obey it. But when will government resources be reallocated to your ministry, to MNR, to help? steer off this clear and present danger. Thank you. 
Minister. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, again, thank uh, the member for his question, and I will uh, recommend and commend and thank the federal government for their investment. I did receive a note on this last week or two weeks ago, their investment. I think the lab is in Burlington. It's welcome. It's proactive. We thank them for their investment, uh, speaking very clearly to initiatives of great concern to ours. But I would say to the member that uh, as is often the case, Ontario was proactive on the issue and, in fact, moved on this issue far before this announcement last week about the lab in Burlington. Again, I think it was one or two years ago, a very short time ago, where through our government we made an investment of $15 million or so dollars in an invasive species research centre in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, in the former minister's riding. So, in fact, Speaker, I would say to the member, the legislation was there. We've invested in our own lab and research centre in Sault Ste. Marie Answer. on this issue. So, it clearly, very, it speaks very clearly to obviously how seriously we're taking the issue. As I've said, we look forward to the earliest opportunity to reintroduce the legislation, the invasive species. Thank you. New question. The leader of the uh, Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, the Liberal Trojan Horse budget contains a lot of surprises, but it's missing a lot of things too. For years now, Families in Kingston have been fighting to save their local schools and preserve their downtown, but Liberals refuse to listen. This budget does nothing to stop the closure of Kingston Collegiate and Queen Elizabeth Collegiate. In fact, it leaves even more schools at risk of closing right across the province. Will the Premier explain why her Trojan Horse budget leaves Kingston schools on the chopping block? Minister of Education. Thank you, Premier. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. Uh, I actually uh, want to talk about some of the things that are in the budget for education. So, for example, over the next 10 years, we actually have $11 billion investment in new infrastructure for schools. Over the, and in particular, over the, the uh, next few years, we've got a huge investment of billions of dollars in funding to renew schools, because we know that many of the schools on, in Ontario were built for uh, the baby boomer generation, and that in many schools in Ontario, we actually do need to have uh, some retrofitting and some renewal going on. So we have a significant budget that is specifically targeted at renewing schools throughout Ontario Answer. that need some upgrading. But I am very proud of the fact that we have in invested more in renewing schools and building new schools than any other government. Speaker, this budget sends a pretty clear message to families. The government plans to do nothing to save local schools like the ones in Kingston. In fact, this Trojan horse budget lays out a plan for even more school closures and consolidations in small towns and urban neighbourhoods across our province. Even more parents will be forced to fight just to keep their local neighbourhood school open. The Liberals might call it a plan to, quote, reduce surplus space, but communities and families call it, plain and simple, school closures. Why won't the Premier listen to families right across Ontario and, instead of closing local schools, do the right thing and keep them open, including the ones in Kingston? Thank you. You know, one of the things that I found really fascinating when I was looking at uh, the, 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 uh, their platform uh, was they thought it would be amazing if they spent $60 million on school infrastructure. Has anybody listened to this? $60 million versus billions, and they're complaining that we're not spending money on schools? Please, Speaker, this makes absolutely no sense. But one of the things that I was also delighted to see this year was that uh, we, we've actually started to talk to boards about how they can make use of school space together, because there are a number of small rural communities where there are a number yes, of schools, all of which are half empty. And in fact, part of that capital funding is available to communities where the boards get together to uh, use school spaces together and make sure they have a good Thank learning you. place for children from a variety of boards.
The question, the member from Davenport. Merci, Monsieur Speaker. Ma question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My Mr. question Speaker, is for the Procureur General. Commitment to ensuring equal access to justice for the people of Ontario. I know that the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Aid Ontario have worked together over the years to provide legal aid services in Ontario that are effective, sustainable, and support our most vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, I also understand that Legal Aid Ontario, an arm's length and publicly funded agency, has introduced two new programs to further support community legal clinics and frontline cl client services. These clinics include valued agencies such as Parkdale Community Legal Services, Question. West Toronto Community Legal Services, and Unison Community Services, which together serve the riding of Davenport. Mr. Speaker, could the Attorney General please tell us more about these programs introduced by Thank Legal Aid Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to thank the MPP for Davenport and congratulate her for her election. Programs. Depending on an individual's eligibility, the first program funds 10 hours with family lawyer to engage in settlement discussions and finalize separation agreements. The other provided six hours of legal advice for those who have chosen mediation services to settle disputes. Innovative legal service programs such as these two programs are made possible by commitments from our government, including the $30 million increase, which we committed in our 2013 budget. This funding is meant specifically for family law services and demonstrate our government's belief Order. that community and legal clinics play an integral role Member in Ontario's Jeffrey justice Kaladin system. To order. So this is part of our poverty reduction strategy, and I was very uh, pleased to uh, see the announcement by Legal Aid last week. Well thank done. you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Attorney General for that answer. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to hear of our government's continued commitment to providing legal services to all Ontarians, regardless of their circumstances. As the Attorney General just mentioned, in the 2013 budget, we committed to investing $30 million over the next three years in additional funding to Legal Aid Ontario. This funding will go directly to the improvement of frontline client services through family law, service centres and community and legal aids, not only only in Davenport, but across the whole province. Mr. Speaker, could the Attorney General please tell us how the 2014 budget, if passed, will continue to show our commitment to the delivery of frontline legal services? Thank you. Attorney General. Again, Mr. Speaker, I'm so impressed with this member because she really cares about the constituents that are less fortunate in her community. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that if passed, the 2014 budget includes a strategy to expand access to legal aid by raising the income eligibility threshold to qualify for legal aid assistance. Currently, legal aid income eligibility threshold is at $10,800 for an individual. The budget proposed an incremental increase of 6% per year over the next seven years. So Ontario Legal Aid System helps ensure Ontarians have access to the legal service they need. So again, this is part of our poverty reduction strategy and thanks that we were re-elected because there's some, someone, a party, who is speaking on behalf of the less fortunate in our community. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Your question, the member from Kevin. Essex. Very good. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, Bob, minister, over the past uh, two and three quarter years, I've established a very positive working relationship with former MNR ministers Gravel and Orzetti. Good guys. Very Where good. Are they Rondeau Park is the home to 283 cottages, and these cottages belong in Rondeau. This park was first chartered as a cottage park back in 1894. That's 120 years ago. You got to do the math. These guys. Throughout the decades, cottagers have lived in harmony with the park's nature. <clears throat> Minister, in past, I presented a win-win solution that would keep the cottagers in the park while being sensitive to the revenue challenges, its ecology, and endangered species. Minister, will you commit today to working with me so that together we can come up with a plan to keep the cottagers in Rondo well beyond their, quote, get-out-of-town deadline of December 31, 2017? Here, here. Okay. 
Speaker, thank you very much. The, uh, the member puts the pressure on me greatly by beginning his question by reminding everybody that I'm following in the footsteps of Ministers Gravel and Minister Orizetti, but I, uh, I'll do my best to meet his concern and his challenge. <laughs> Speaker, the issue reg regarding Rondo and the leases that exist obviously have garnered a great deal of attention over the last number of years. When I was not a minister, I followed the debate closely. I listened to it closely. As the member has said in his question, uh, the leases do not expire until the end of December 2017. There is no decision imminent. I have been briefed on the issue. We are discussing it on a regular basis, but I will tell the member that I'm more than happy to work with him on an ongoing basis. I'm not apprised of his suggestions in relation uh, to what he sees as the solution for Rondo Park. He's just suggested Answer. to me that he has some. I'm interested in hearing those, and I look forward to working with the member on this particular Thank you, Speaker. Minister, in order to preserve these heritage cottages, action needs to be taken now. Right. Cottages are in need of repair. Decades of family memories are at risk of being destroyed unless we come up with equitable solutions to their dilemma. Environmental, environmental reports are in but unfortunately economic assessment is not. Minister, I do have a plan to restore Rondo to its glory days where there was a buzz <coughs> within the community and a beehive of activity drawing families to the park. My fond memories include hiking, archery, biking, swimming, fishing, boating, and family picnics. Minister, you're from the great Ontario Northland. I know that you can relate and would not want to see these activities evaporate from Rondo landscape. Cottagers need the park, but more importantly, Minister, the park needs the cottagers. Minister, will you commit today Question. to ensuring cottagers remain in Rondo Park? Here, here. Thank you. Speaker, one of the uh, things, uh, for lack of a better word, that the ministry uh, went forward with in terms of policy related to the leases at Rondo was the commissioning of two additional studies, uh, both environmental and economic impact. It's my understanding, I believe the member said in his question, that one is in and one is not. It's my understanding that both of the studies are completed, that both of them are in, and that the results of both of those studies are being reviewed about the potential impacts that and the data that they yield in terms of the, de the uh, decision-making around Rondo. I would add for the member as well, it's my understanding, that third-party review is being undertaken on both of the studies, both the environmental study and the economic yeah, ac activity study, so that we can very reliable count on the data that is yielded from both of those studies, and that will infuse our policy and decision-making process on a go-forward basis. So once we've had an opportunity to view Answer. the detail from those studies, uh, we'll be in a better position to advise the member of a decision going forward. Thank you. Any question? The member from uh, Agoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you. My question is to the uh, Minister of Finance. The Power Dam Special Payment Program was implemented in 2001 to replace the property taxation revenue associated with the hydroelectric electric plants when they were deemed exempt. In the case of the community of Wawa, 47 per cent of their property assessment base was declared exempt. If this Liberal government proceeds with the cancellation of this program, Wawa and 110 other small communities will be unable to meet their financial obligations. Will this government stop the cuts to the Power Dam Special Payment Program before many of these communities are forced into financial crisis? Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and and, um, and I thank the member opposite for the question, as well as his advocacy. I know that he's been uh, concerned about the effects that this will have on the communities in the north, particularly Wawa. We're having ongoing discussions, as we said we would. I appreciate uh, the correspondence that you've had with me, and we are taking this up with the municipality, recognizing uh, the adverse effects that that would have on one particular community uh, versus the overall policy that we're putting forward. We're sensitive to that, and I congratulate you for bringing it forward as well. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> Again, to the uh, Minister of Finance, the, uh, the Power Down Special Payment Program is a very small program, but the impact of the clawback is large for many small communities. The payments from this program are significant contributions to the revenue base. Since 2001, the payments have not kept pace with either inflation or property taxation rates in any community, resulting in an unfair shift to the remaining assessment base. The only way for communities to recapture the lost revenue is through a property taxation increase or by cutting services. Minister, 
Please tell the good people of Wawa how progressive your budget is again. And will this government do the, yes, do the, to, do the right thing and assist Wawa and, and 110 other communities affected by the significant loss Question. of revenue due to the cuts of your budget is implementing? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, my, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be working closely with the Mayor of Wawa to ensure the effects of this municipality are properly managed. We recognize the importance this has in the municipality to receive su uh, su uh, appropriate level of support, but keep in mind that combined with OMPF, the province's upload has increased by $1.3 million since 2004, more than 85%. In 2014, this support includes nearly $2.1 million through the OMPF, which is a equivalent to $1,222 per household, nearly 12 times the provincial average, and over $850,000 through the provincial upload to social assistance benefits. So we recognize the importance of our municipalities. We are partnering with them, including Wawa, and our ministry will reach out to the municipality representatives to seek input as Answer. part of our consultation process so that no one is adversely affected. We recognize exceptional circumstances in Wawa, and again, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. I'm incredibly proud of our government's aspirational priorities that were laid out in the throne speech, Mr. Speaker. International businesses are coming to Ontario, and local businesses grow here because of the talent and dedication of our workforce. That is why our government's throne speech, we are committed to building a stronger business climate. It is this government's ambitious goal for Ontario to become the North America's leading jurisdiction for talent talent, skills, and training. To achieve this goal, Mr. Speaker, our government must have a pan-Ontario vision that understands regional considerations and needs. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please inform the House on how his ministry's vision on skills and training development that will build a stronger northern economy? A good question. Thank you, Mr. Northern Development. Well, thank you very much for the question. I, I, I thank the member for Scarborough Agent Court. We are not going to get a supplementary, so I do want to make sure I get to the regional component, but certainly we are very, very proud of our government's determined and focused uh, approach to skills development. The 30% uh, off tuition grant has made a huge difference to Northern Ontario um, uh, students at university and college in terms of getting their first degree. Uh, the Youth Employment Fund having a real impact uh, already, 2,100 uh, students in Northern Ontario. But the, the Northern component that's so important really is the, uh, uh, the, the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation's co-op and intern program. We've invested over $63 million uh, which leveraged close to another $36 million from community partners. Partners, We've been able to create almost 4,000 co-op placements and internships since 2005. Yes, so they are now getting the work experience they need to here, succeed. Here. So uh, these are great examples of programs that work to, to develop the skills uh, that are needed to, to move our diversified economy forward in Northern Thank Ontario. you. And I thank you for the time, Speaker. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.